start and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Tim Wilson, I'm director of Handy CSTPD, the Centre for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence, and uh, particularly good to see so many of you here today for this Terrorism and Civil Wars Symposium. Um, thank you for uh, dealing with strikes, coronavirus, so on and so forth. I will not deny it's a programme that's taken uh, a few hits, we've had to rearrange a few of the sessions and ended up with a worse gender balance than originally intended, just to be upfront about that, that was not my intention. Uh, but I think we do hopefully have uh, a good symposium still for you today. A particular welcome to the ISWS students. Um, it's really been a sort of driving idea of mine behind uh, this particular event, but also a longer term uh, agenda that we have more dialogue in the School of International Relations um, between those of us who study what I think of as the, the, only, the only acronym I will ever found in the political sciences of sort of uh, PVN, political violent nastiness. Uh, in other words, uh, the genocide, war, terrorism, all the things that we study in IR at St Andrews, and which for I think St Andrews deservedly has uh, a very strong reputation. You know, we have real expertise, security studies, uh, strategic studies, peace and conflict studies, uh, as well as regional expertise in troubled parts of the world, um, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and so on. And it often seems to me we, we, we're not always more than some of our parts, uh, so I hope that today uh, is a step in that right direction of encouraging dialogue across some of those disciplinary boundaries, but also sometimes just institutional boundaries that the research centres grow up different ways. There aren't always good reasons why we study one type of political violence under one rubric rather than another. So thank you, as I say, for um, turning out. We will uh, run today's program pretty much as it's shown on the uh, symposium uh, outline here, possibly with a bit of flexibility around timings. Uh, unfortunately, my ex-student, um, Jürgen Branch, who I was hoping to lure back, he's got a book coming out on indiscriminate violence and civil war, uh, with the monograph series at the centre that I edit uh, with the CSTV, he has unfortunately been grounded with coronavirus, so you know, no, no bluffing, a real, a real case. Um, so we're going to probably have a shorter session uh, in the middle of the day, maybe start lunch slightly later and so on and so forth. So I would ask you just to be a little bit flexible around timings, but we'll, uh, we'll be upfront about that. Uh, also, if you need to find toilets and things, you can navigate your way through the labyrinthine corridors of the very 1970s psychology department. They're apparently that way, and also that way downstairs where the, the catering is, but there are signs, so good luck with that. Okay, so as I say, um, my idea for today was to encourage interdisciplinary dialogue, and I'm actually delighted that we could not be in better hands, we could not have a better guide than today's star guest and keynote speaker, Professor Staffies Calabas, Gladstone Professor of Government at All Souls College, Oxford. Um, I hope you will forgive my introducing him as truly one of the big beasts of the political science um, jungle. Uh, the graduate program at Chicago is known for having a sort of attrition rate, um, probably not much about that of many terrorist groups in their first year. Uh, it's pretty notoriously brutal and produces pretty uh, extraordinary success stories uh, at the other end. And of course, South East was one of those, doing his PhD in political science in Chicago in 1993. Uh, triumphant march through increasingly prestigious uh, institutions followed, at a higher stage in New York, Chicago again, Yale, uh, and currently, of course, Oxford. And with that march came not so much a relentless bombardment as a sort of relentless carpet bombing of major publications, uh, including The Rise of Christian Democracy in Europe, Cornell University Press, 1996, which won the J. David Greenstone Award from the American Political Science Association. Uh, and then, of course, in 2006, the truly paradigm busting logic of violence in the civil wars with Cambridge University Press. I tend to think that political science produces relatively few true epics. You know, one of those few epics is surely um, my predecessor, Professor Alex Schmidt's quest for the definitive definition of terrorism, which he spent 40 or 50 years on, sort of, you know, Captain Ahab, saving the high seas of knowledge, uh, trying to nail, trying to, trying to catch the whale of the final definition of terrorism. But I think, you know, those, those are rare. But surely logic of violence and civil wars is just such an epic. 
contribution as well, winner of no less than four major scholarly awards, and a book that really revolutionised how we think about what happens in civil wars, particularly the violence off the battlefield, the sort of non-military violence, which is so often the major majority of it. Now, that interest in political violence alongside, I think it's fair to say, continuing interest in electoral politics as well, has also seen heavyweight article-length contributions, including many uh, specifically on terrorism, for those of you who are interested in that. Paradox of Terrorism and Civil Wars, Journal of Ethics, 2004. Um, the provocatively titled Absence of Suicide Missions, you know, chasing an absence, always a hard thing to do. In a vested collection by Diego Gaffetta, making sense of suicide missions in 2005. Is ISIS a revolutionary group? If yes, what are the implications? Perspectives on terrorism in 2015. And many other numerous related contributions on militias, rebel governance, collaboration, often within uh, a broader uh, rubric of, of, of looking at civil wars, but not just. So this Calabasian canon is truly impressive in range and depth, and if I may, it, if I may pay what to me is the ultimate compliment as a historian, also grounded on true archival diligence of actually going to find old stuff and, and dig it out um, with, with real stamina. So, as I say, we are in extremely good hands today, and I was delighted when Staffies sort of took really took my invitation running and said he would like to uh, really give us a kind of tour of the horizon, a sort of, uh, as I understand it, a wide-ranging um, paper on uh, how we study political violence broadly understood and how we might do so better. So, Staffies, I'm deeply grateful to you for honouring our 25th anniversary. I'm deeply grateful to you for making the long trek north and also for holding over what should have been last night's Paul Wilkinson Memorial Lecture into what effectively is now Paul Wilkinson Memorial Seminar uh, today of the really being the sort of the, the major foundation of today's symposium. So Staffies' uh, keynote will, will be, take up most of the morning up until lunch. We'll have about an hour, I think, and then uh, sort of half an hour's questions before we go to lunch. But then if we sort of tops and tail at the end of the day with a round table where I've invited various colleagues to respond to uh, that lecture. So Staffies is speaking to us today on the deceptively simply titled, no doubt, if I know him at all well, massively ambitious political violence, a research program. Staffies, over to you. And as you can see, I mean, the slight change uh, how did they turn integrated. I didn't turn around and read that, sorry. Uh, well, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. I don't know what I should do as a beast. I should start fighting or perhaps engage in other beastly activities. Uh, all I can say is that there is quite a lot in this talk, and so um, you will have to digest before starting lunch. Um, and uh, let me give you a sort of um, uh, a small history of this project. Uh, this derived from um, a deceptively, what I thought was a deceptively uh, easy task, which was to give an overview of political violence as a general field for uh, students who were taking a class in the context of the summer course that I organized uh, in Greece. Uh, and so I kept adding things, correcting things, and then I dawned on me that um, there are some very interesting uh, insights that come from this kind of juxtaposition. Uh, and so I wrote, uh, I developed that as a very short, very concise paper for uh, a handbook on uh, the Austrian handbook on, on Paris, which we co-edited uh, last year with some of my uh, co-organizers of that summer course, Andreas Gropas and Richard English. Most of you know him as well. Uh, and then after that, I, I had this idea that perhaps I should take it a step further into a book, which has led me into um, an incredible uh, journey uh, across a variety of different literatures. Uh, and so it's a type of work that we no longer do very much because uh, the ratio of uh, uh, time spent reading and publication is not ideal. But at the same time, it was very instructive, even though sometimes also quite confusing. And so what I'm going to try to do is to bring some order to do that. And in order to do that, of course, uh, I'll, I'll make some choices that are going to grade some of you, hopefully, so you, can, you can push back and we can have an interesting conversation. But choices have to be made if one has, you know, tries to, uh, in a sense, take on all of that mass of material and reorganizes it. So let me motivate this project with a number of questions. Uh, there was a very big debate recently about what happened in Bolivia. Uh, as you know, the uh, leader of the country, uh, Evo Morales, uh, called elections, 
Uh, he tried to fumble with those elections. There were widespread accusations, including by the Organization of American States, that those elections had been fraudulent. They had to be interrupted. There was a series of mass protests. He insisted on going on. Eventually, the, the police unit muted uh, it, and, and then eventually there was a sort of military coup that kicked him out of the country. There was a very big debate. Is that a coup or is there a revolution? Uh, with unclear answer. At around the same time, we had all these uh, weekly demonstrations in France called uh, Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vests. Very violent, very large number of injured people, including injured policemen. Primarily material damage, but a lot of uh, uh, quite uh, high level of uh, very bad injuries. Lots of people lost their eyes, for example, uh, by the police use of uh, um, special tech. Rupert, Rupert Val bullets, um, and uh, very intense in its uh, rejection, not just of the government, but of the entire system. The Gilets Jaunes want to completely reorganize the French political regime. Why don't we call it a revolution, instead calling it demonstrations? Um, you also know the very big discussion about who the Taliban are. Uh, they've been called terrorists, they are designated as terrorists by the U.S. State Department, which nevertheless felt the need to negotiate with that, even though they supposedly never negotiated with terrorists. But there is a question, how should we understand what they do and how should we code their acts? Um, as I'm going to say later on, a lot of what they do ends up uh, in the major data sets of terrorism and gets analyzed as an instance of terrorism. My favorite is the, I, my favorite question for my American students is always whether the American War of Independence can be called a civil war. By the definition of the civil war studies field, which I, to which I contribute, it is a civil war, it's an intrastate war. Civil war uh, is understood as a war that takes place within a state. So the American War of Independence was a secessionist civil war within the British Empire, as all the anti-colonial uprisings and wars of national liberation. Uh, but of course, when you say that uh, to an American student, they get not upset because they were not as closely connected to it, but certainly sort of very surprised that the American War of Independence could be called the Civil War, which is the term that is being used for the American, the American Civil War. Uh, if you want to start a fight, there is no better way than to call the Ukrainian uh, war, the war in the Eastern Ukraine, Civil War, if you are Ukrainians, if you are with Russians. Uh, uh, you want, and you call it a proxy war or an intervention, they're going to get very angry as well. And that tells you how the use of those terms very often can be very politically sensitive. And the same is true about um, the persecution of the uh, Rohingya in Myanmar. Uh, for many people, it's an instance of genocide. And uh, if to those people you say, well, perhaps it can be called something different, they would react in, in a similar way as the Ukrainians would react if you call it a civil war. Uh, and finally, there's a very big discussion in the US about the treatment of migrants from Mexico. Uh, forced detention, uh, sort of pushbacks, uh, the way in which uh, young children have been uh, separated from their parents, and a lot of people have argued that this should be called a mass atrocity. Uh, and so all of those questions point to the fact that, number one, questions of violence very often uh, are at the center various debates, including politically very fraught types of debates, and at the same time that you don't really have a minimum consensus about how to designate to really describe a lot of these things, let alone study them. So that sets, this, this question sets the uh, boundaries of this project of mine. We have lots of terms to designate very often the same thing, and different, uh, and different ways to approach them. We have lots of subfields. Uh, people specialize in different uh, aspects of the same problems of political violence. And as a result, lots of confusion. People who work in different subfields can no longer easily communicate with each other. Uh, I'll give you two examples of that. One, I call it three Guatemala problem. If you look at the literature on the conflict that took place in the 1970s, early 1980s in Guatemala, there are three very distinct literatures. There is one literature that treats what happened in Guatemala then as a genocide indigenous people. There is a literature that treats it as an instance of state repression. And then there is another literature that treats it as a, as, as a civil war and counterinsurgency. 
uh, and the people who com contribute to those literatures do not necessarily read each other. They live in different planets. Um, same with it, what I call the free cool problem. So the, the first one I mentioned in my first slide, the uh, coup in Bolivia. Well, the people who very strongly claimed it was a coup, including Jeremy Corbyn, didn't call what was uh, happening in, in Catalonia a uh, coup, which is what the Spanish regime used as a way to describe the attempt by secessionist politicians in Catalonia to secede. Uh, and in fact, the leaders of that movement were tried uh, on, uh, on and accused of sedition and rebellion. But uh, you know, the people who thought um, what happened in Bolivia was a coup didn't think that what happened in Catalonia was a coup. And then uh, a lot of the people who looked at what happened in Venezuela was was a coup or revolution also distributed themselves in ways that wouldn't be predicted on the basis of the analytical content of those categories, but rather whether they liked the plotters or the organizers or the poor, or the poor they, they, they disliked the people who were targeted by that. Add to that lawyers who always complicate our job. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, uh, the statute, the Rome statute of the International Criminal Court, you will see that it recognizes four types of crimes for which the court has jurisdiction. The crime of genocide is one. Um, mass crimes against humanity is the second one. War crimes is the third one. Crimes of aggression is the fourth category. And if you look inside those, those categories, they're a mess. You find everything in ways that are completely, to my more analytical mind, very difficult to make sense. Why, for example, uh, is the invasion of one country in another country coded as a war of aggression? And how is that different uh, if that war gives rise to human rights violation, how is that different from the war crime, for example. Uh, these are complications. They may help very much the uh, objective of prosecuting these kinds of things, but they don't help us making sense of why something is happening as opposed to others in the ways they do. And as a result, there is a tremendous lack of consensus in that very broad field. And this lack of, of, of consensus, as I said, is driven by real life politics, which is very important in that field. But it's also uh, driven by academic politics, which basically means that uh, once a field or a, a term is created and people start using it, they have no incentive in deviating from it. In fact, they have an incentive to keep using it in the same way because that justifies their own existence. It's called the professional incentive and it's pretty powerful. So one has to push back against all of those in order to bring in some discipline and some clarity in that, in that field. The consequences are very obvious. Uh, first of all, we have a difficulty in communicating. People who study genocide, people who study terrorism very often cannot really communicate with each other. Uh, we also have obstacles to simulation. We're learning a lot of things, but it's not clear how those things add up, especially across these various subfields. Uh, it makes it very hard to think about the temperature because of those debates that we see low. Uh, and it creates a sort of institutionalized myopia in which important questions, interesting comparisons, and insightful arguments tend to be neglected just because they don't fit in how we ask those questions. And as a result, uh, and, and there is another thing that uh, I discovered, which in the course of my research on this project, I think uh, is probably one of the biggest uh, sort of uh, uh, pluses to this project, which is that uh, we have difficulty even narrating certain uh, events. If you look, for example, at histories of the French Revolution, the terminology that's very often used to describe how that set of events develops over time uh, is, is quite difficult. And so we don't really have a good vocabulary to narrate complex events that contain a lot of violence. That was not always the case. Uh, and if you go back in time, which we never do, because we never have, we're never self-conscious of our origins as a field, we would discover, as I did, that the field was once integrated. And when people started uh, wanting to bring social science to the study of political violence, they did it in a way that was comprehensive and unified and integrated. 
uh, and it starts with people like uh, Harry Eckstein in 1965, and basically his students, uh, people like Rommel, Fedger, uh, and then people like Douglas Hibbs, who in 1973 published a book called Mass Political Violence. Um, what is very interesting about that story is that eventually these people become, in a sense, move into the field of international relations primarily, and become uh, the pioneers of the quantitative studies of interstate war, even though initially what they studied was domestic violence. Um, in fact, if you look at the two main biases of that approach, of how political violence was conceptualized then, uh, you would notice two very striking ones. The first one uh, uh, was the domestic versus international. They explicitly excluded international events. They wanted to focus on the domestic events. So there was very early on a bifurcation, people studying international security versus people studying political violence, which was understood as domestic violence. In fact, Harry Eckstein, in his 1965 paper, calls this, this field, internal war, and he doesn't mean by that civil war, he means every type of violence that is not interstate war. So you have internal war and international war. So that was the idea of how to structure the field. And the second bias was that these people were primarily concerned with violence against the state. And that was also the result of the uh, politics of the time. Uh, the 1968 revolts, uh, the riots, the black riots in American cities, created a sense of urgency for understanding or trying to understand why societies become unstable and people rise up against the state. So it was not so much about understanding how the state uses violence, but about how the state is being targeted by violent factors. Uh, after that period, uh, what happened was that this political violence field basically, and I'll explain why, vanished, fragmented. Uh, and as I said, intellectually, these people are really only read today primarily if they are in the field of uh, the quantitative study of war, of international war. There, was two, there were two attempts to resuscitate political violence as a more unified field. The first one, was by Charles Tilly, who in 2003 published a book called uh, Collective Political Violence, which basically went nowhere. He tried to replace every term that we have with terms of his own invention. That didn't make much sense. Um, and the second one is not a very well-known book by Randall Collins, who is a sociologist. It's very well-known in sociology, but not very well-known outside of it. And it's basically an attempt to uh, try to make sense of violence by going down to the uh, lower level of disaggregation. He believes that at the end of the day, the way to study political violence is to study, to decompose it into its component, component events, which at the basis are in, in a sort of violent interaction between individuals, what he calls the violent process. And so eventually, he, he argues, you can understand everything if you understand the logic of that individual clash that is at the bottom of every kind of interaction. And again, that really didn't have, didn't resonate very much outside the field of sociology. So that's the, the general picture. Why did the big sort of effort of the early 1970s, late 1960s uh, not amount to much, uh, especially given the optimism that these people had that with the use of computers, they were going to be able to crack social science. They were going to use, uh, to use a term uh, that was not used then, but was almost used. They were going to use machine learning to make sense of human behavior. They were going to be able to forecast and predict human behavior with computers. It didn't work that way. So what they came up with are these kinds of charts. This is from the Douglas Gibbs book. It basically tells you that efficacy, which is how effective a system, a political system is, which is very, very often is measured by how people think the system is effective as a response to surveys. So that turns out to be negatively correlated with illeg illegitimacy, which means it's positively correlated with legitimacy, but it makes it more difficult to understand if you stay in those terms which basically means that if a system is not 
effective, it's perceived as illegitimate, but of course the way it is measured, the effectiveness is often, say, measured with legitimacy. And if a system is illegitimate, it increases the likelihood of strife and decreases the likelihood of regime durability, which is also affected directly by strife. So that's basically the idea. Now, if you translate that into plain English, it means if people are unhappy, systems are unstable, which is not really a very big peek into the heart of social dynamics. Uh, that's it. Sorry, it was not the Hibs, it was the Gerb uh, one of the tens of papers that were published during that time. This is from Ted Gerb's book. That's the other alternative. The so-called, you know, the, the precursor to spaghetti charts. Everything correlates with everything. Uh, so if you look at any of those boxes, discrepantly low base value position, which is basically again a, a sort of way, a complicated way to measure uh, unhappiness and grievances, correlates with intensity of relative deprivation which correlates with potential for collective political violence. So basically the same kind of understanding. People are unhappy, systems are challenged. And, and that is a sort of, uh, if you want, you know, it's not only that these kinds of analysis didn't really add much, but also they, they sort of reinforce the story, which in my, in my view is not always correct, which is the idea that grievances are disorganizing for political systems, which turns out not necessarily to be the case on top of it. So it was both uh, uninsightful and potentially wrong. And as a result, you know, a lot of that work stopped on its tracks. And people basically continue to do that in more sophisticated ways, but in more narrow venues. So how can we do that? How can we go back to this initial ambition of a more integrated, unified field of political violence without necessarily falling into these kinds of traps is the question I ask. And obviously the, the, the wise answer is to avoid the errors that played those predecessors of ours. The, the only way to do that is to read them, which nobody does. Because if we did, we would realize how a lot of what we believe were being achieved with things like machine learning and artificial intelligence very often repeat the claims that were made during that period, and in my sense are going to result in the same kind of non-result. Uh, and also avoid the belief that it's possible to come up with a single theory that would explain every manifestation of political violence. I think that was the very big mistake. Thinking that unifying the field meant you could provide a unified explanation. And so my argument today underlying my project is that we can unify the field without, in fact, by consciously issuing the idea, pushing back against the idea that we can actually provide a single answer. And of course, we should avoid the tea trap, I think that in new terms. I'm going to argue we have to use and work with the terms that we have, because that's the only way to communicate, even though a lot of these terms are very problematic. So we have to fix the terms as opposed to try to replace them. So the key steps that I, I'm proposing to do are the following ones. Improve on the concepts. And I'm going to explain how I'm doing that. The second one is to proceed by inductive identification. That is, look at what people do today in terms of existing fields and research agendas and research programs and use those fields instead of denying their existence or trying to reorganize. Uh, provide a, a unifying typology that doesn't have the biases of the past, that is, incorporates both the international dimension and the state's dimension. And then that's the most important thing that I want to emphasize, which is draw a set of logics that connect the different types together. That is, uh, in a sense, shifting the question, instead of asking what causes political violence, ask a different type of question which is a step eventually to better understand what causes political violence, which is to ask why we get a certain type of political violence as opposed to another one. That's not a question generally asked in the field. So how to improve the concepts? I argue, well, it is well known that in typologies, two of the desiderata are 
joint exhaustiveness and mutual exclusivity. So the types have to exhaust the phenomenon. There shouldn't be instances that cannot be classified, and those the types should be mutually exclusive. They shouldn't overlap. And so what I, I'm going to try to do is redefine those concepts in order to minimize how much they overlap. And, and that is probably not going to work in practice because people are not going to necessarily be satisfied with uh, restrictions of their object of study, especially you will see when it comes to terrorism, I, I'm very sort of aggressive in how much I minimize the reach of what terrorism means. And the reason is very simple. If you look at the main data set that is used to study terrorism, the global terrorism data set, the GTB, uh, about more than 80% of the incidents recorded by it are incidents that happen in civil wars. So when people say, for example, there is a global rise of terrorism, in fact, what that measures is the global rise of violence within civil wars. And that violence is violence by rebels against civilians. So, you know, it's not, does not correspond with what we have in our mind as the basic intuition of what terrorism is, which is more of a transnational phenomenon. And if it's domestic, it's not one that is actually taking place within a civil war. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to very much insist, pushing back against Caribas 2006, a very broad book that you mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to very much insist on, on a very macro perspective. I want to understand macro aggregate formations, not individual mechanisms, repertoires, processes, incidents. So I want to understand, for example, why we get, uh, you know, say, the war of Iran, Iran against Iraq as opposed to an insurgency within Iraq or a terrorist campaign within Iraq. I want to understand these kinds of big things that include a lot of things inside that. But at the same time, I want to make macro concepts very flexible. Otherwise, the connecting logics won't work. I don't want to provide a sort of static structure of the whole, but I want to have categories that allow me to explore what's going on inside them. I'm going to explain how I try to do that. So, very quickly defining political violence, which is also something where someone has to be quite aggressive. Um, it's a term that's prone to verbalism, excess, uh, and self-indulgence. And so I, I very much push back against that. By political, I mean actions that are explicitly and directly political. That is, they do not necessarily change relations of subordination, but make claims uh, either against or in favor of those in power in ways that are, of course, violent. Uh, and that's how it connects with violence, which I understand as being restricted to physical harm. So not symbolic, structural, and what have you. Not injustice, inequality, and poverty. That's not violence in my book. Because if that is violence, then we study everything at the same time, which means we study nothing. So I restrict it very much to uh, situations of direct physical harm. And so political violence is, in a sense, violent political action. And usually, not always, but usually it is undertaken by collectivities, by collective entities. So here's the, put all the issues of the definition on the side now. We have it pretty clear. There are some issues, as always with definitions on the margins, but I think that sort of sets us up uh, for the next step, which is inductive identification. As I said, um, I use as criteria existing categories. Um, I was interested at actions, not outcomes of actions very important because very often people study, especially when it comes, for example, to revolutions, they mean successful revolutions. Uh, the basic condition is for those phenomena to be independent, to exist as self-standing phenomena, even though they very often occur in other forms as well, but they have to be identified as self-standing phenomena. Um, and as I said, I'm interested in, in broad macro types as opposed to mechanisms, which were still is uh, objective repertoires of violence. And, 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 or, you know, in my case, in my 2006 books, I was looking at incidents. And as I said, no neologists. And the idea is that, in a sense, no matter what the definition of each type is, 
there has to be a basic intuition, and that basic intuition has to correspond to pretty much what the basic intuition is that we have about this type of violence. It shouldn't be something exotic or you know very you know sort of challenging to understand it. Um, because the goal, as I said, is to clarify, to simplify, and minimize overlaps. So as, as I said, the starting point for me was the existing fields and literature, so kept reading a lot. Uh, and I came up with 11 types, which I'm going to give you in a, in a moment. Some of them are well known, such as terrorism and, and genocide, and, and others are not as well known. For example, intercommunal violence is not as popular a term as the other ones. But all of them get a lot of Google hits. There are terms that are being used, deployed, etc. How are we to relate all those types together? Because they have, in a sense, to correspond. You cannot have a typology in which one type is interstate war and another type is ethnic conflict. Because a lot of interstate wars are between different ethnic groups. So you have to satisfy the criterion of mutual exclusivity. And that assumes that those types exist on a certain continuum, on a dimension. Um, and so here I have two intuitions that I'm using. The first is that violence is, is almost by definition relational. So we're trying to find the first mover. Perpetrator is not used here in a legal term. The first mover, the person who takes, or the group that takes the initiative to launch uh, a particular type of campaign, uh, and the target, who is being targeted, even though very often the targets are indirect, people target civilians, but in order to hurt a state, for example. Um, and so we want to understand who is the actor, uh, in a sense, launching or taking the initiative, keeping in mind, of course, that this is also a function of prior developments as well. And the second idea is that the state is a key actor in violence. You cannot study violence, political violence, without including the state in which is obvious. So if you think about that dimension, you get three groups. You get state versus state violence, which is interstate war. You get non-state versus non-state violence, which is intercommunal violence. And then you find that every other category includes pretty much interactions between states and non-state actors. This is where most of the action is in terms of types, not in terms of numbers. Probably interstate war causes tremendous number, numbers of fatalities uh, historically. And you can even create a two by two if you think about the prime mover and the respondents, the first mover. Um, usually in interstate war, it's one of the two states by definition that's going to move. When it comes to intercommunal violence, it's one of the two non-state actors that is going to move. If you look at um, first movers, uh, the state as a first mover, you see that it's primarily instances either of state repression or demographic engineering, genocide and ethnic cleansing, in which the state, in a sense, takes the initiative to launch violence. Of course, the state may believe that they do so in order to anticipate violence that is coming, but from my perspective, that's good enough. And you see that most of the action then is an action that comes from the challenger, which makes a lot of sense. Challenging the state is not an easy thing, and therefore there is a diversity of strategies on how to tackle the state. Which fits very, very nicely with the bias, the domestic and anti-state bias that the field had in the 1960s. The reason they had it is it was because they realized a lot of the action was there, but of course they didn't have, they didn't articulate it that way. Okay, now we've positioned all our types. We can discuss those 11 types individually, which I'm going to give to you very, very quickly. Um, give you some uh, elements of the big debates that are happening in each of those fields, and, and, and then conclude with uh, my discussion of how those processes are connected. Uh, what do we know about interstate war? Quite a lot. It's probably the oldest field uh, of political violence, and, and we don't think of it as a field of political violence. Right? Because uh, it's been developed as a separate field for a very long time by military historians, people who study international security. It is, uh, in a sense, the um, mother field of the field of political violence, if I can use this metaphor. Uh, and it's the highest form of collective violence, even though there is quite a lot of variation within interstate wars. 
which is not surprising simply because the state is the most sophisticated of human collectivities, the most complex, the biggest, the best organized. Uh, very important to point out, because it goes back to debates about state legitimation that were so central in the 1960s, one of the reasons why people believe states are legitimate and governments are legitimate is because of interstate war. Interstate war is a, is a mechanism of legitimation of states. Um, we can say a lot about violence within interstate war. I don't want to dwell too much about that. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a very interesting distinction, I think, between battlefield violence, which was the first one to be legally regulated, violence against civilians that only, whose regulation only came after the Second World War, and the gray zone of collateral damage, which has been the contribution of the US wars of the 21st century, uh, and it's going to be very, very much talked about. And the very big debate, which is about the decline of war, uh, we all agree that there has been a very significant decline of interstate war since 1945. We don't agree whether that signals in a secular shift in human history or not. And there's no way to solve the question because it depends on the sample you use in order to extrapolate. But since 1945, that's the situation we're in, a situation in which interstate war has become exceptional. Uh, and there are a number of theories what, you know, in terms of what explains that uh, decline, which you probably know quite well. One is democratic peace theory. Another one is a theory about normative shift, popularized by people like uh, Steven Pinker, among others. So we think that killing people, that you know, states killing other, other people from other states is not a civilized thing to do. Technological changes, especially the attack of nuclear weapons, making major uh, power war um, a non-starter. And uh, finally, ideology. Very interestingly, nationalism has been a force against war. Initially, it was certainly a force that led to interstate war, but eventually, nationalism is, is a sort of the, the ultimate anti-war ideology in the sense that uh, people have become nationalized as citizens, and therefore wars of conquest are not convenient because you cannot incorporate people who are already nationalized, have an identity that's not yours. That brings us to civil war, uh, which in the key intuition about civil war is militarized contests within states. It has to be a war within a state, right? It, it is a literature that developed very much in the 1990s and 2000s, and it's probably the leading literature of political violence today, the study of civil wars. But for many years, it was thought as a lesser kind of war, because most people who studied war wanted to study interstate war. The studies of civil war were thought of as second-rate wars, and therefore people, scholars who study second-rate things are also second-rate scholars in a way. Um, but it's become the default type of war. If you, if you want to study war today, you have to study civil wars, because that's the only thing in the basket. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on violence, partly as a result of this book by Kalibas in 2006, unfortunately. And a lot of it is driven by humanitarian ideology. So if you look at the introductions of most papers and books on civil wars, they start with a statement that we have to study civil wars in order to prevent them because of the human damage they cost, which I think is a misleading way of justifying why we study civil wars. Um, people are fascinated by civil wars, as I said, because of this barbarity that supposedly um, characterizes them, which turns out to be much more complex and difficult argument to make. But there is a dimension that also fascinates people, and that is the intimate character of civil wars. So, People who study, for example, Northern Ireland, which for any sort of, from any perspective, is a civil war of sorts, are fascinated very much by the intimate nature of the Irish conflict, the fact that people who knew each other who were neighbors who lived in the same city who turned against each other. That traditionally is one of the biggest motivators to the study of civil wars. Um, 
and in a sense, civil war entails a study of the interaction between insurgent and incumbent violence, even though that can break down and we have proliferations of different groups. There is a lot of work today in trying to get counterinsurgency right that is driven by the US juggernaut, and it's feeding a lot of money into research projects. Uh, but there is a, quite a lot of work on insurgent violence, and a lot of people who study terrorism, in fact, study terrorism within civil war. There are now some explicit papers about that. The best predictor is low GDP per capita. Civil wars tend to be primarily events, phenomena that happen in poor countries. Uh, but historically, that was not always the case, and almost every state that exists today, in some way, kind of fashion, has been the result of the civil war. Uh, there's been a very interesting trend, which is after the end of the Cold War, there's been a very steep decline of civil wars. But uh, in the last 20 years, we've seen a slight uptick, and there's a big debate about whether this slight uptick is actually not so slight, and whether it signals, again, a change. Uh, and there's been lately also quite a lot of work on the systemic dynamics of civil wars, because people realize that civil wars are not just domestic processes, they're very international processes as well. And a lot of discussion about the relationship between civil war and democracy, because one of the channels of post-Cold War democratization has been civil war settlements. Revolution. Again, I put a picture uh, of uh, a revolutionary event which is not understood usually as a revolution, and that's the Paris, Paris May 68 uprising, student uprising. Uh, which had all the characteristics of a revolution, but it's not called a revolution because it didn't result in the collapse of the regime. Uh, and so the way I redefine revolution in a way that students of revolution do dislike very much is basically as mass street action against the government that reaches the level of mobilization and violence that qualifies it really as very high levels of contention. There is a field that studies mass uh, in, in a sense, that's the direction of the field of revolutions. After they ran out of steam, they gave rise to a field called mass protest, mass contention, and social movements. Uh, these, these are people like Charles Steele, uh, Sid Taro, Scott McAdam, and others. And it's very present in sociology. But they study every type of mass protest, from the most meaningless demonstrations of three people in a picket line to sort of regime changing events, right? Uh, and you have a tremendous variety of terms here, things like uprising, rebellion, insurrection, and lots of literatures. It's a very complex field. Uh, most of the revolutions do not necessarily produce human victims, but a lot of material damage. Uh, but a key expression of revolution is its the fact that it comes in waves very often, especially the revolutions that have systemic effects, tend to be contagious. Uh, and very often that's what we describe as revolutions. Uh, and what is very interesting is that if we look at the post-Cold War revolutions, is that they're also a very big conduit to liberal democracy. That is, most revolutions that happened after the end of the Cold War, and I would say probably after the end of the Iranian revolution, are revolutions to democratize and in a sense to westernize countries. Uh, and so here we have a very interesting paradox about revolutions, uh, which is that there are extremely consequential under autocracies where they are not supposed to be happening, where they're risky and difficult, and very little, you know, not of much political consequence in democracies where they are very easy to organize. So that's why nobody calls the Gilets Jaunes a revolution, even though it is a revolutionary uh, phenomenon. But because nobody expects that the Gilets Jaunes are going to bring the French regime down. Whereas when you see a mass protest in Iran, immediately you jump to the idea that it's potentially a revolution that has the ability to bring the regime down. So democracies are immune, liberal democracies are immune to revolutions, which is a very interesting kind of uh, point to make. And you, you see the way I describe to you a lot of these events is to show you how those different types are connected to larger 
processes such as regime type that we care very much about. On stage repression, what I have to say is that the, the intuition very much as described is the idea of re the state repressing its own population short of war, civil war, for example, where that repression takes the form of counterinsurgency. And again, uh, we have lots of literatures about state repression. Very often a critique of the field of terrorism is that it doesn't really uh, look at the state, but in fact there is a very, very big field called state repression, regime terror, state terror, with its own data sets, which are coded exclusively to uh, characterize the violence of the state against its own population. And so you want to restrict it to situations of peacetime and not occupation, because situations of occupation very quickly devolve into civil wars. And here the key finding, which resonates with some, some of the things that I've said before, is the so-called democratic, uh, domestic democratic peace. Unsurprisingly, democracies tend to be much less violent uh, in the ways they repress their citizens. Uh, and there is a very big perennial debate in that field, which is unsolvable, I think, which is the repression dissent nexus. People want to find out under what conditions repression works, meaning repression depresses dissent, and under what condition repression backfires. And hundreds and hundreds of papers have been written to try to answer that question. And I don't think it's a question you can answer. It's very sensitive to very small things. Genocide is also a very problematic category because we basically have been contaminated by the legal definition, which is very expansive. Uh, but I think the, the key intuition we can draw from the idea of genocide is that it's the idea of trying to annihilate, to exterminate a group. It's not about uh, killing civilians in the context of either repression or counterinsurgency. It's a very specific uh, project. Uh, and as I said, the problem with the legal definition is it's so expansive that even actions that do not necessarily result in violence but are planned to do so can be characterized and prosecuted as genocide. The, the bottom line here is that genocide is not predicated on the level of mass violence. It's predicated on an intention, which is very, very difficult to actually record, of exterminating a group. If the group is small, the violence is not going to be very big. So as a result of a number of those characteristics, it's a, it's a very rare phenomenon. Uh, and the studies that we have of genocide tend to find a correlation between war and genocide. The genocides tend to happen under conditions of war, which will point us in the direction of connections, as I mentioned before. But of course, genocide and war are distinct, which satisfies the condition of um, uh, joint uh, uh, exclusiveness. That is, nobody would say that the Second World War and the Holocaust are the same event, even though they overlap. And even though they're related, the Holocaust probably couldn't have happened without the Second World War, but the two are distinct. And it's as historically associated, we, we know from the work of Michael Mann and others, with the process of state formation. So it is, in a sense, if you want to think about the future, it's logical to expect situations of genocide to arise when boundaries of states get redrawn, or in situations in which, say, the nation state may be replaced by another entity. Ethnic cleansing is very similar to genocide, but it is predicated on displacement as opposed to extermination. And the idea that this displacement is intended to be permanent, that's, I think, the key aspect. And so some, some people call it genocide by displacement or genocide light. Uh, it is not very well developed, but in the last 15 years, we have a number of books and papers that look at it in a very systematic fashion, so it's a growing field. Um, and it's also very much fed by the process of refugee seeking, mass migration in the context of civil wars, etc. But the basic intuition is that it's a form of demographic engineering, is that people are being displaced to change the, comp the composition of, of the nation states. Uh, and sometimes it's internal, as in the ethnic cleansing by Stalin during the uh, Second World War, but most of the times it's external. You want to basically get rid of populations that you believe are disloyal. And so the acid test for ethnic cleansing is whether people can return after the process itself is over. 
And again, the key finding we have here is, is driven by war, so not regime dialogue. Very often, it's just war that drives these kinds of events. And historically, again, it's associated with transformations of multi-ethnic states into nation states. So it's very historically determined. Military coups are very interesting, uh, even though they don't cause a lot of human loss in lives. It's the idea of illegal takeover of power by a military faction. And it, it's been quite studied in political science, uh, actually. It's also very much predicted by low GDP, so it follows the same logic with civil war. It happens in very poor countries, which also happen to be poorly institutionalized. Uh, and it has experienced a significant decline after the end of the Second World War. Uh, primarily, it's an intra-autocratic phenomenon. It's the replacement of one dictator by another. However, what is happening in the last, the period after the end of the Cold War, War is the rise of the so-called good coups, that is, coups that produce, that lead to democratization. Uh, and what is very interesting is that uh, it's very connected with processes of revolution. If you look, most revolutions eventually succeed because they trigger a military coup. So again, that takes us to the direction of connections. Political assassination is unusual, but traditionally, historically, very consequential. And it's the targeting of high officials and state leaders uh, by non-state actors. Uh, there is a data set in political science. Uh, it happens during peacetime primarily, much less likely in democracies than autocracies. And it's, of course, very consequential where the state is very personalistic. So it seems to be a relic of the past. Uh, I come to terrorism, and I'm reaching the end slightly, which is of interest to you. And that's how I think of terrorism. I think of it as organized violence by clandestine non-state actors. So the violence has, been, has, to, has to be organized, and the key feature has to be the type of actor who launches it the clandestine dimension of that factor. Um, even though the numbers are small, the impact is high. Uh, and my understanding of terrorism moves it away from its understanding as indiscriminate violence by non-state actors, as its civilian targeting, because a lot of terrorist activities are against hard targets, especially security forces, and against this idea of a method intended to produce fear. I think it's, it's good not to have, to include in understandings and definitions what the intentions of the actors about the South Korea, with the exception of genocide. What we know about the existing field of terrorism is that it has a complicated relationship to both income and regime. It doesn't follow either the low income or autocratic regime character of some of the other types, but it has a very strange U-shaped relationship, but again, that may be due to the data sets and the data that's included in those data sets, which are very mixed, that they include a lot of civil war violence. Intercommunal violence, on the other hand, is relatively new as a field. It basically entails the violent interaction between non-state actors. Now, the state may be on the side, it may be encouraging action, very much like a foreign power may encourage a domestic actor in a civil war, but the primary actors are non-state actors. Who are they? They're going to be crowds, usually described as ethnic or sectarian crowds, or they can be militias, which are also very often organized on that identity basis, attacking people. And then we have a sort of very interesting new field or new area of investigation, militia wars. That is, situations in which militias operate independently uh, and fight against militias of other groups. So it's a sort of more militarized type of civil war, of, 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 uh, of intercommunal violence, but it's not a civil war because the objective is not against the state. Very often, traditionally, this type of violence was referred to as riots and pogroms, with, uh, as I said, the state either absent or indirectly present. A lot of work on intercommunal violence about how the state manipulates that, that type of violence. So my point is not that the state is irrelevant, but it's not the primary player. 
Very interesting finding. In poor democracies, intercommunal violence tends to happen around election time. Very often, the argument about the types of conflicts that are driven by climate change have to do with intercommunal violence, not about other types of violence, even though they don't say so explicitly. And I would argue that the best way to think about low-level uh, self-radicalized terrorism uh, or mass shooting with an incoherent type of political message would be to think of it as hate crime, which would we, pos we would position as at the low end of intercommunal violence. So instead of having debates about what is domestic terrorism in the US, I think that would be a much better way to try to understand this type of violence, because primarily it involved non-state actors attacking other non-state actors. I'll conclude with organized crime, which very often is not included in typologies of political violence, but very often organized criminal actors have either attacked the states because they want the states to legislate in specific ways that facilitates their business, or are forced to rule local communities in a sort of tilly, tilly way and therefore become de facto states on the ground. Uh, and so, especially the cartel violence in Mexico has been understood to some extreme as a criminal insurgency, which is a term that doesn't make a lot of sense in my eyes, but certainly with, it, it is a political process. Uh, and it is often uh, studied and understood in the process of transition to democracy, a situation that creates an opening for new actors to emerge and play a very important role in the context of the ancient flows. In terms of key factors, I would uh, emphasize the relationship between violence and democracy or regime type, the fact that they do not necessarily work in the same way, which is if you had all these types of political violence coded as events, as they did in the 60s, and run a regression, you, you know, the results would wash out because you have this kind of systematic heterogeneity driving these processes. And I'm going to close by discussing four types of connections, with, which I think is basically the takeaway of my presentation, which is why I think it makes sense to move in that direction, because we have a, a whole world of new hypotheses once we start thinking about connections between those types. So the first type of connection is what I call opportunistic connections. Opportunistic connections are basically the idea that some types emerge and because they emerge, they create opportunities for other types to emerge such that didn't exist before that. That is, the counterfactual is that in the absence of the original type, you don't get the other one. And so it's either an opportunity or an externality logic. Um, think about a civil war that erupts within a global war. And go, you know, remember here the term that I, I used initially I want to provide a vocabulary to describe things that we cannot, cannot otherwise describe. There were lots of civil wars during the Second World War in Europe and Asia. But because we think of those two terms as being mutually exclusive, we didn't really have the vocabulary to describe civil wars within interstate wars. So now we do, and we find that big wars very often create opportunities for civil wars to emerge within the civil war in Yugoslavia within the Second World War. State terror within interstate war. You can think of the um, displacement of the uh, internment of Japanese Americans as a form of state repression that only emerges because the United States entered the war against Japan. Genocide against interstate war, which I mentioned, is a very big predictor. Uh, ethnic cleansing inside civil war. Civil war providing the opportunity to redraw boundaries all the discussions, for example, about violence in Baghdad during the uh, American occupation was about rearranging the boundaries of Baghdad to make it sectarian, homogeneous, sectarian, homogeneous from a sectarian perspective. Intercommunal violence within civil war, a lot of the violence that is happening in South, in South Sudan is not violence associated with the two sides. It's violence that emerges in pockets that are created because the war is going on and that is only tenuously related to the civil war per se. Intercommunal violence inside cartel violence, 
So one of the things that we find in Mexico is in some states like Michoacan, Michoac you have militias emerging to protect local populations that then become involved in, in various local wars. Again, very tenuously related to the main uh, issue. Second type of connection, what I call instrumental connections. And instrumental connections are that sometimes they're used as an instrument, as a tool, in order to achieve another type of political violence, which cannot be achieved without that tool. So terrorism can be a strategy within civil war, especially in places in which the rebel group has to operate as a clandestine actor. So if you look at Sri Lanka, the LTT fights a guerrilla war in areas in which it has territorial control, but in Colombo, the capital of the country, it has to have to, to, to conduct the terrorist campaign. Now, you see that terrorism can happen within civil war, but the thing to understand in order to make that connection, you have to have an understanding of civil war and terrorism as distinct, not as overlapping things. Intercommunal violence as a method of genocide. This is what the Germans did in large swaths of the Soviet Union, and this is how the Rwandan genocide unfolded. The, mobility, the mass mobilization of local communities against their neighbors. Um, third type of connection, transformational logic. This has to do with how a type of political violence morphs into a different type through escalation or de-escalation. It's not about opportunity so much as about the process of structural change. Uh, a coup may become a civil war if it fails, like the Spanish Civil War was started in the sense of triggered by the coup. An insurrection that fails, a revolution that fails, like in Syria, can become a civil war. Or the opposite, the civil war may die down into intercommunal violence, which we have a hard time naming and calling because the civil war has ended and presumably we live in an era of peace. That's the topic of countless books about uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Or a civil war may die down into criminal violence, which is what presently is happening in Colombia, in which a lot of the demobilized groups are becoming criminal bands, engaging in criminal activities. Finally, the fourth logic is what I call substitution logic, which methodologically is extremely important. And the basic idea here is that sometimes are used as substitute for other types, because the other types cannot be used. Uh, and that has tremendous implications for regression analysis because it introduces uh, selection bias. You can think of interstate and civil war as such. The reason why we had such an escalation of civil wars in the Cold War period was because interstate war between the Soviet Union and the United States was not possible. Uh, terrorism is a substitute for civil war. The reason why the IRA engaged in what is called as terrorism, acted clandestinely, is because it couldn't fight openly in the guerrilla war against a very powerful state. And that's why we find that some of these terrorist campaigns in Europe happen against very wealthy states. Civil war can be a substitute for coup. This is the Philip Rossler argument about Sub-Saharan Africa, that for some leaders in those countries, purging their military of people who can actually organize a coup against themselves makes sense in spite of the fact that this may start a civil war, but they feel safer with a civil war in the periphery than with a coup, uh, a looming coup against themselves. So to conclude, I want to say that we have, and this is only a small sample, in fact, you find that if you multiply 11 by 11, you come up with a very large number of very interesting connections that, in a sense, set up a very interesting research agenda that is you know, the way we study these things now, for the reasons that I described, uh, are not necessarily in the, in the, uh, in the cards, uh, and when they are, not in the optimal way. So we have, I think, a very rich research agenda in front of us. The second thing I want to also emphasize is what I said, that you know, I think that by using this vocabulary, we have a way to describe very complex events in a way that's better than what we have to do today. So take the French Revolution very complex event. It starts with a revolution as a mass protest, not even that, it starts you know, in a variety of other ways. And then everything happens inside it, interstate war, civil war, uh, terrorism, uh, you name it. Uh, so I think we can, in a sense, re-describe complex events using a more precise language.
which I think is, is also very, a very important uh, added value of that. So I, I, I went on for a bit too long, I hope not to. I'm going to today, today's chest. But thank you very much for your attention.